This HIV update provides an overview of OI prevention and treatment, presented by Dr. Jose Montero. The activity planners do not have any financial relationships with commercial entities to disclose. Dr. Montero has financial relationships with the following commercial entities to disclose. Grant Research Support, Merck. Dr. Montero will not discuss off-label use of investigational products during this presentation. This slide set has been peer-reviewed to ensure that there are no conflicts of interest represented in the presentation. Upon completion of this program, participants will be able to define the difference between primary and secondary prophylaxis of opportunistic infections in HIV-infected individuals, identify what CD4 count antimicrobial prophylaxis would be needed to prevent pneumocystis urovetsi pneumonia, toxoplasma gondii infection, and mycobacterium avium complex infection in HIV-infected individuals, Outline key clinical syndromes and diagnostic tests available for key OI, including pneumocystis gyrovetsi pneumonia, cerebral toxoplasmosis, mycobacterium avium complex infection, and cryptococcal meningitis. Recall the primary recommended treatment for OI, such as pneumocystis urovetsi, cerebral toxoplasmosis, mycobacterium avium complex infection, and cryptococcal meningitis, and choose general principles in vaccination of HIV-infected patients, including issues regarding live vaccines. The following statements relate to continuing medical education and continuing education. This session is approved for up to one hour of CECME. This enduring activity has been planned and implemented in accordance with the essential areas and policies of the Accreditation Council for Continuing Medical Education through the joint sponsorship of the Florida AHEC Network and the Florida Caribbean AIDS Education and Training Center. In order to receive CE or CME credit, you must complete an evaluation survey, which includes a request for CE CME. The evaluation survey link will be provided at the end of the video. When asked in the evaluation survey, indicate that CE CME is requested. You will then be directed to a survey that must be completed for our CE CME provider. The CE CME provider survey will include a post test assessment. You must achieve at least a 70% in order to receive CE or CME. Participants will be able to print or save their certificates after successful completion of the post-assessment. Please note, if you received CE or CME credit for the live webinar that took place on February 17, 2015, you are not eligible to receive CE or CME credit for this on-demand module. Good afternoon, everyone. We're really happy to have Dr. Jose Montero here with us today to provide an update on opportunistic infections, prevention, and treatment. Dr. Montero is a faculty member with the Florida Caribbean AIDS Education and Training Center and is an associate professor in internal medicine in the Division of Infectious Diseases and International Medicine at the University of South Florida Marsani College of Medicine. He treats HIV patients at Tampa General Hospital and the Hillsborough County Health Department. And without further ado, I will allow Dr. Montero to take it over from here. Thank you very much, uh, Joanne. Basically today, I'll, I'll, this opportunistic infections is a huge topic. So I'm going to just slim it down quite a bit for this talk, focusing on four entities most, most commonly seen in, as opportunistic infections, including pneumocystis, toxoplasmosis, MEI, mycobacterium avian complex, and cryptococcal meningitis. We will also focus on a little bit of vaccines in, in, in the nature of prevention of um, opportunistic infections in our population as well. So the definition of opportunistic infections is, is easy. It's basically infections that occur more frequently or more severe due to immune suppression. That can happen in other populations aside from HIV, including solid organ transplant patients, or patients who are receiving hydrocorticosteroids for other reasons. But in this talk, we're going to focus on HIV. 
and it, it still remains a problem despite antiretroviral therapy. The risk of opportunistic infections really correlates with our CD4 count. That's our marker of immune state. And unfortunately, um, we still see opportunistic infections because some people are still diagnosed very late in their stage of HIV and therefore are unaware of their HIV status until they um, obtain their first opportunistic infections. Others, while they may be aware of their HIV status, still may not be receiving care. And others, while they're receiving care, still may not have attained very good virologic or immunologic response to antiretroviral therapy. So while we see fewer of these this decade as we did you know, two or three decades ago, they still are quite common if not diagnosed early enough. The risk of opportunistic infections changes depending on CD4 counts for certain entities. And in this chart we see here, um, this is the main ones that we should be worried about as far as relationship with CD4 counts. Um, it is well recognized that pneumocystis uh, georgesii, or PCP, is well recognized that you see those with CD4 counts less than 200, and that's when risk increases. Once your CD4 declines even further, less than 100, you start seeing other opportunistic infections, including toxoplasmosis, cryptococcosis, and once your CD4 count drops to less than 50, other risks come into play, including those with mycobacterium avian complex, cytomegalovirus, and an entity called JC virus, which can cause what's called PML, or progressive multifocal leukoencephalopathy. It's basically a cerebral disease that can, that can be seen in those who are very end stage as far as uh, immune state from HIV. Concepts about prophylaxis. When we talk about HIV prophylaxis with medications or with vaccines, we're talking either primary prophylaxis or secondary prophylaxis. Primary prophylaxis, what you're trying to do is prevent the initial episode of an opportunistic infection. Basically, you want them to never have this opportunistic infection, even though they've never been exposed to it before. The risk is delayed by the CD4 count, such as what we've just went over on the prior slide. Secondary prophylaxis is different. In secondary prophylaxis, you already had the opportunistic infection once. You've treated it, and now it's inactive, and you want it to prevent recurrence by giving some maintenance therapy or other prophylaxis to prevent the recurrence of this infection. Primary prophylaxis is indicated with, with medications or vaccines for these entities that we have listed here. P for medication we prevent with PCP, tuberculosis, toxoplasmosis, and MEI. Vaccines also are very helpful to prevent infections um, primarily through pneumo pneumococcus, strep pneumonia infections hepatitis A and hepatitis B, as well as influenza in our population. As you see, secondary prophylaxis means, again, they've actually had the infection and want to prevent its reoccurrence. The top three we've already listed is primary prophylaxis. They also have secondary prophylaxis that's indicated for, for them. And the bottom four are examples of other entities that once you've been infected with them and you've treated them, they may require maintenance therapy or secondary prophylaxis to to prevent recurrence. Let's start with pneumocystis chorinia pneumonia. How does it present? The typical presentation is that of progressive exertional dyspnea with fever, usually a very dry, non-productive cough, and chest discomfort. This type of pneumonia is not something that comes overnight. This is something that really slowly comes up and, uh, uh, and, and takes care of a patient and presents with the patient. Uh, it takes maybe days or even weeks to present. Initially, they may have some weakness, and then over the days, more cough and then more um, oxygen hypoxemia. The chest exam, if you do an exam, it may be quite normal. Or they may have what's called diffuse dry rails where you actually hear crackles, but they're not volume overload like you would see in someone with heart failure. They may have tachypnea or, or tachycardia as well presenting in their manifestations. The diagnosis many times is, is, is clinically done, but blood tests and radiographs are also suggestive of the diagnosis. What's, what's key and seen very commonly is a degree of hypoxemia, meaning there's a degree of significant oxygen exchange problem that occurs much more than you would expect with a typical pneumonia. It's usually quite significant where the partial pressure of oxygen is less than 70 millimeters of mercury or what we call the AA gradient, the gradient between the, what, the oxygen in the uh, lungs and the oxygen in your blood is quite high, meaning the oxygen doesn't diffuse into your bloodstream that well, and they have problems 
in that manner. Lab-wise, we see what an LDH is quite elevated. However, that's not a very specific lab finding because LDH is found in lung tissue, it's also found in blood, it's found in liver. So other things can cause an elevated LDH. But it is commonly seen in people who have pneumocystis pneumonia. Uh, pneumonia. When you get a chest x-ray, you can have various presentations. In someone who's very dry or very dehydrated, the chest x-ray can, can look quite normal initially and can fool you. Um, the typical manifestations are, however, bilateral interstitial infiltrates that can progress um, uh, over days. Uncommonly, but sometimes seen, is actually a spontaneous pneumothorax because you can get small little cavities in these lungs of these patients. And one of these cavities can actually pop, so to speak, and cause spontaneous pneumo pneumothorax, causing sudden shortness of breath in these patients. It may require chest tube or other interventions to, to help them breathe better. The definitive diagnosis, however, requires demonstrating the organism usually in two different fashions. Either induced sputum, where we actually had the patient try to cough their phlegm up. However, you can see the sensitivities can be quite varied. Patients are very sick during this period of time. They have a dry cough, and they may not be able to bring up phlegm from their lungs, and you might be only able to get spit, and therefore the sensitivity can be varied. Or you can, get, you can do this through bronchoscopy, where you actually put a bronchoscope down the patient's lungs, wash the lungs out, so to speak, do a bronchoviol lavage, and as you can see, the sensitivity rises substantially where most individuals have a positive test in that fashion. How do you treat these individuals? Well, there's two major, major issues. Number one, you need antimicrobial therapy. The duration of antimicrobial therapy um, is 21 days for treatment, and then you go to secondary prophylaxis. The preferred therapy by far and away is trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole otherwise known by brand names of Septra or Bactrim. That by far is the treatment of choice. If you have moderate to relatively severe pneumocystis to the point where they have significant oxygen exchange problems or they're in the ICU or they're intubated, the doses are, uh, are higher than those with mild to moderate disease as you see listed there below. You can use oral therapy with Septra or Bactrim uh, two times, three times a day orally for mild to moderate disease, while IV therapy may be required for moderate to severe disease. An important adjunct therapy for these individuals is actually steroids. And it's really indicated if they have significant hypoxemia defined by uh, a partial pressure of oxygen less than 70 done by arterial blood gas, or again, an AA gradient, again, usually calculated with, with an I, uh, with an ABG as well. Steroids can be given either IV or orally. Typically, they're given orally in, in the form of prednisone, 40 milligrams twice a day for the first five days, then 40 milligrams daily for five days, and then tw followed by 20 milligrams of, for the rest of the three-week course that's, that's listed there. If they're unable to take IV, I mean oral, you can use IV methylprednisolone at 75% of the dose that prednisone is listed there. Again, the reason you use this is because initially, if you start treating them Early on, the inflammation that you see gets worse, the oxygen exchange gets worse, and these patients can get worse before they get better. The steroids help attenuate that worsening, um, and therefore people usually don't have the exacerbation of the inflammation that exists there, and they exchange oxygen better. What happens if you're allergic to sulfur or you cannot take sulfamethoxazole, trimethoprim? These are the alternatives that are listed for moderate to severe pneumocystis. You can use IV pentamidine or primaquin and clindamycin, um, IV and oral as listed there. If you only have mild to moderate disease in the alternatives, you can use dapsone plus trimethoprim or primaquin plus clinda at the doses listed there. Another agent that's used commonly for mild to moderate pneumocystis for both prophylaxis and for treatment is atovaquin as listed at the bottom there. It's a, it's a solution form where you can get 750 milligrams twice daily for mild to moderate disease. What about primary prophylaxis? When do you initiate primary prophylaxis? Well, you initiate primary prophylaxis easily by identifying those who are left in, who have a CD4 less than 200 cells per microliter. Also, by guidelines, those who have oropharyngeal candidiasis or they have a CD4 percent less than 14 percent should be considered as well for, for primary prophylaxis that those individuals have been found to have a higher incidence of pneumocystis. You can discontinue primary prophylaxis if they, the individual has been placed on HIV therapy, antiretroviral therapy, and their CD4 count has risen 
to above 200 cells per microliter for more than three months. Again, you got to make sure they're above 200 cells for a continuous three months at least before you can discontinue primary prophylaxis. If, some, if the individual unfortunately declines in the CD4 count, you should reinitiate primary prophylaxis if they decrease the CD4 to less than 200 cells per microliters. The preferred regimens for this prophylaxis is, again, trimethylamine cell methoxazole. You can use a double strength or a single strength pill daily as your preferred regimen. Alternatives listed below include trimethylamine supplement double strength three times a week, and others, if they're allergic to sulfur, include dapsone, dapsone plus pyrimethamide and uh, leucovorin, or again, a total cone can be used with or without uh, pyrimethamine and leucovorin for primary prophylaxis. One agent that's given it in a different route, and sometimes utilized because it's given it a different route, is aerosolized contaminating. It's given monthly uh, via a special uh, nebulizer called a respiratory tube nebulizer um, for individuals who are intolerant of septia and can and need other agents to try to um, uh, receive primary prophylaxis. There's an asterisk around several of these regimens, as you see there, because many times these individuals are not only less than 200 um, CD4 count, but they're less than 100 and need maybe toxoplasmosis uh, prophylaxis. Those that have an asterisk in these also are good for, for uh, toxoplasmosis prophylaxis. So once you've, once you've had pneumocystis, you're on secondary prophylaxis, when can you stop? I've, that's a good question as, as commonly seen. You can discontinue secondary prophylaxis once a patient has received HIV antiretroviral therapy and has had a sustained increase in their CD4 count from originally less than 200 cells to greater than 200 cells for at least three months. They have to be continuously above that for at least three months. And at that point in time, uh, it's generally safe to discontinue the secondary prophylaxis and you can, and you can discontinue at that point, assuming they're going to continue their antiretroviral therapy and improve their health as expected. Um, however, you might have to maintain prophylaxis if CD4 count decreases again to less than 200 cells or if PCP recurs at a CD4 count greater than 200 cells per microliter, which rarely occurs, but I have seen it. It, has, it is possible. We're going to shift from pneumocystis carinia pneumonia to toxoplasma gondii encephalitis. This is an organism we ingest at times, and usually all of us have no issues with it um, after we ingest it, except for you can reactivate in, in people who are immune compromised. So those who are immune compromised can can present with symptoms such as focal encephalitis with headache, confusion, maybe a motor weakness, and fever. It almost looks like sometimes a stroke-like symptom, depending on the location of the focal encephalitis. You can get focal neurologic abnormalities. It may, you may progress to seizures. They may have altered mental status, depending on how much of their brain may be involved. And if it's very serious cases, you can progress to coma. Diagnosis, for definitive diagnosis, you need several things. You need compatible clinical syndrome, as what we described in our previous slide, imaging usually either done by CAT scan or MRI, and detection of an organism in a clinical sample, a brain biopsy. I will tell you, most people don't get a definitive diagnosis because of the last one. No, not many people succumb to a brain biopsy uh, very freely. So many times we, we actually give presumptive diagnosis in treatment. Again, a CT and an MRI usually just depicts multiple ring-enhancing lesions, often with significant edema. Occasionally, a, a PET scan or a SPECT scan may help distinguish toxoplasma encephalitis and lymphoma, but that's not a perfect way of doing it either. There, there are uh, limits to the sensitivity and specificity as well. Other things to mimic toxoplasma gondii encephalitis in AIDS, HIV patients and AIDS patients. Those include CNS lymphoma. Again, CNS lymphoma usually gives you a single lesion, whereas toxoplasma encephalitis can give you multiple lesions. Microbacterial infections such as TB can also mimic this. Several fungal infections can mimic this. Chagas disease, if you're in that part of the world, can mimic this. And then brain abscess and progressive multileukocephalopathy can, can also mimic some of the symptoms of this. So many times we, we end up treating empirically when it's very highly suggestive, but at times, we have to go to the brain biopsy when, when the picture is not clear for a more definitive diagnosis.
So treatment for these individuals included multiple medications put together. It's usually a combination of pyrimethamine, uh, weight-based, plus sulfadiazine, plus sucavorin. This combination of medications actually gives you a high CNS penetration of, of, of sulfur drugs that actually help treat the toxoplasma cysts and, and, and kill it. Duration of treatment can be quite long, at least six weeks and, and many times longer is needed if there's extensive disease noted in the brain or there's a slow response to therapy. Remember, these lesions in the brain that you see by CT and MRI have significant swelling so much so that they cause significant neurologic dis uh, uh, dysfunction. So sometimes there's a need for corticosteroids such as decadron or dexamethasone to decrease the swelling and decrease the mass effect to improve the neurologic outcome of an individual. And many times anticonvulsants are needed because they've already had a seizure or they're at such high risk for seizures. So you will see that many times those two agents prescribed at the same time as treatment for toxoplasmosis. So once you've had the disease, you get put on maintenance therapy after those initial therapy. The preferred chronic maintenance therapy, if you look, it's the same drugs, slightly lower doses than the induction therapy that was needed for over six weeks. But it is basically the same drugs uh, depending on the weight as well. If you're allergic or intolerant sulfadiazine or sulfur medications, alternatives include clindamycin plus pyrimethamine and leucovorin or tovacone plus or minus pyrimethamine and leucovorin, or sulfadiazine if they are not allergic to uh, sulfa. Again, sulfa works better, but we realize that people that are allergic to sulfa and alternatives are available uh, as listed in this slide. So how do you prevent recurrence? You've got this person who's had toxoplasmosis. They've responded. They're on chronic maintenance therapy. When can you dis discontinue this? So it, it can take a while because you, you, you can only discontinue maintenance therapy and consider it in those who are asymptomatic after they had successful therapy for toxoplasmosis encephalitis, are on HIV antiretroviral therapy, and they've had a sustained increase in their CD4 count to greater than 200 cells for more than six months. Many individuals will still get an MRI before treatment discontinuation to be sure that all the mass lesions are gone. You might have a little scar left over, but they want to make sure the mass lesions are gone and there's no enhancement that persists. It's important to make sure that, because um, you don't want to, uh, uh, to still have a reversal of the symptoms that are, that are neurologic in, in nature. You may have to restart sec uh, secondary prophylaxis if the CD4 count decreases to less than 200 cells per microliter. So how do we prevent exposure? Well, as, as many of us know who take care of HIV patients, when we first see them, all HIV patients should be tested at baseline for IgG to toxoplasmosis. Remember, for an AIDS patient in the brain, this is a disease of reactivation. That means you've actually had to get exposed to it at some point. And if you get exposed to it at some point, you develop IgG to it. So we, we check that at baseline to detect if they've had a potential for latent infection. Those who are seronegative means they are negative for IgG, have never been exposed to this. So we should counsel them about sources of infection to prevent future exposure. And, these, and those, those counseling recommendations include avoid eating raw or undercooked meat, washing hands after handling raw meat and after contact with soil, if you're in the garden, washing fruit and vegetables before you eat. And if you have um, kittens or cats, see, clean the litter boxes daily and wash hands afterwards. Key is washing hands afterwards and making sure, because we always put our hands everywhere around our face and we can always potentially um, accidentally expose ourselves. So for primary prophylaxis, we give, we give drugs in those CD4 count less than 100. Remember, PCV was 200. Toxoplasmosis is less than 100. A lot of these are going to look similar because there are similar drugs to, to pneumocystis. Trimethyl and sulfamethoxazole can be used in various doses. The recommended dose, however, is one double strength daily. The alternatives are listed there three times a week or single strength daily. And then Dapsone, which could be used alone for pneumocystis, needs other medications to, pre to prevent toxoplasmosis. So you need Dapsone plus pyrimethamine and leucovorin. Dapsone alone, while providing PCP prophylaxis, does not provide toxoplasmosis, gondii encephalitis prophylaxis by itself. A total cone can also be used with or without pyrimethamine and leucovorin for prophylaxis. So if you have a patient who is seronegative when they came to your clinic 
And for whatever reason, they're not on antiretroviral therapy, and, they, and they, CD4 count declines. It is urgent that you actually reassess if they're still negative for, for toxoplasmosis. Unless they're already taking pneumocystis, pneumonia, prophylaxis, that's also effective against toxo. For example, if they're taking trimethamine supplementoxazole. But realize that you can acquire that anytime in your life. And it's good to make sure that when their CD4 count declines, if it does, that you're prepared to provide prophylaxis for toxoplasmosis. When can you discontinue primary prophylaxis, that is preventative prophylaxis for toxoplasmosis? You can discontinue if they ha they're on effective HIV antiretroviral therapy, and if their CD4 count is above 200 cells per microliter for at least three months. If they decline again, you have to, may have to restart prophylaxis if their CD4 count decreases to less than 1 to 200 cells. And the guidelines provide this range because we really are not sure whether we should, we should do that. And I personally will provide that prophylaxis if it's less than 200 cells. I err on a side of caution. Next entity we're going to talk about is Mycobacterium avian complex. I think this is probably the most common OI I see nowadays in the hospital setting. And probably one of the ones that gets re um, not recognized as well and, get, and doesn't get as much credit for causing the disease that it does. I call it the poor man's TB because it has a lot of the same symptoms as tuberculosis. But, it, but, it, but it's different. Clinical manifestations are not specific. Fever, night sweats, significant sometimes unintentional weight loss, generalized fatigue and weakness. All four of those are TB-like. The last one, abdominal pain and chronic diarrhea are less TB-like, but it can be seen if mycobacterium immune complex has a lot of GI involvement, which, which you can see quite commonly. Again, this can, these are non-specific symptoms, so it's, I, we can see how sometimes they, these can, symptoms can be attributed to HIV itself, or other entities that these individuals may have. The diagnosis sometimes is not easy. Suggestive lab abnormalities include a white count is quite low, anemia, and then sometimes an elevated alkaline phosphatase without a, a good reason to have an elevated alkaline phosphatase otherwise. What happens to me clinically is sometimes I end up treating this empirically while waiting for a definitive diagnosis. Remember, this is a mycobacterium. It takes time for this to grow, sort of like TB when you, when you get when you get specimens for tuberculosis, it takes a while for that to grow. So you have a lot of time there that, 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 is, that is waiting, usually many weeks, to, until you are sure of the diagnosis. So sometimes I get treatment while waiting for a diagnosis. How can you diagnose it? Well, you can isolate the organism um, in several different fashions. The most common is by getting an AFB blood culture. Um, in a simple blood culture tube that's specifically designed for mycobacterium, um, and again, while it's, it's quite effective at detecting it, it can take a lot of time for it to, be po to become positive if MEI is present. Uh, it, we're talking a matter of several weeks to even longer than a few weeks. Other areas where you can uh, isolate the organism that's more invasive but include bone marrow, if you do a bone marrow biopsy. You can do stains and you also can do cultures of that. And lymph node biopsy, because lymph node biopsy, because many of these individuals can have some swelling of the lymph nodes. Uh, that can be from MEI, as well as other entities as well. Occasionally, you can actually also culture the stool um, and do sp special stool stains and culture for AFB. Uh, and you can see shedding of MEI that can help at least corroborate the diagnosis. The best diagnosis for me is the, the blood culture from AFB, but it has to be a specific AFB blood culture, not regular uh, blood cultures that are, are specific for bacteria. It has to be specific AFB blood cultures. Treatment for MAC. So just like TB, you need more than one drug. Uh, and you got to realize that once you start treatment, you're, you're talking a, for definitive diagnosis, it's a, you're, you're committing them to at least more than one year of, of therapy. You must use at least two effective drugs to prevent resistance. The preferred regimen is clarithromycin twice daily plus a dose by weight. How are the, the alternative regimen is probably more commonly used because it's azithromycin daily plus the other dose, plus the thambutol daily. Being two day drugs, um, they seem to be more commonly used. Although, as far as drug per drug, clarithromycin is probably a more effective mycobacterium drug than azithromycin. Um, it is recommended that all M MAI and MAC isolates be uh, tested for susceptibility to macrolides. Because once you have resistance to macrolides, and if you give clarithromycin or azithromycin plus ethamitol, you're giving monotherapy, and resistance can develop, and failures can occur. So along with 
treatment, you gotta help their immune system. So you need potent antiretroviral therapy to initiate and optimize. However, you gotta worry about timing. If you if you if you get potent antiretroviral therapy a bit early, you're at risk of what's called iris or immune reconstitution inflammatory syndrome. Um, and you see iris as many different uh, opportunistic infections. In MAI, it, it, it could be, be significant fevers, the lymph nodes can swell up, the belly pain can get worse. You have different types of symptoms depending on where the bulk of the disease is of MAI in this individual. So to decrease the risk of MAI, uh, of MAI and if they're not on antiretroviral therapy, we actually consider delaying the initiation of antiretroviral therapy at least after the first two weeks of MAC therapy. That way, we sort of try to have the MAI under semi-control before we start uh, improving their immune system to prevent the iris from occurring. The other aspect of the disseminated MAI treatment is the clinical response. We've got to make sure there's a clinical response to therapy. Number one, we've got to make sure that the blood culture that you've given and you, is positive and you do have the actual diagnosis. Um, because those will probably be positive within four to, six, four to eight weeks or four to six weeks. But if there's little or no clinical response to therapy clinically, you may have to repeat the uh, MAI cultures to see if the therapy is effective. And at that point, if that's occurring, either you have issues with medi medication compliance or potentially resistance uh, to worry about. Uh, and therefore, more, um, more treatment uh, or diagnostics may need to be occurring and more uh, agents may be needed to help treat this entity. Once you've given them therapy, how long do we give them? Well, essentially, you give them the same therapy, and it could be lifelong unless their immune system is reconstituted on antiretroviral therapy. Luckily, many times we are able to do that very effectively. But the only can consider discontinuing chronic therapy for MEI after at least one year therapy. They are asymptomatic. Their CD4 counts over over 100 cells per microliter at least for six, the last six months. All those have to all those have to be in play before you can uh, uh, discontinue chronic therapy. And if suddenly their CD4 declines because they've been lost to care or they're not taking antiviral therapy again, um, you have to restart secondary prophylaxis when their CD4 count drops to less than 100 cells per microliter. I like to talk a little bit about preventing a a MAI. What you know, because people don't many times know what MAI is. Again, it's a microbacterium, but it's everywhere in nature. You can't really not get exposed to it. People who have disease are the ones who are immune suppressed. And, and prophylaxis is recommended for all those who CD4 counts less than 50 cells per microliters. But remember, I told you, this acts a lot like TB. So before you give prophylaxis, you should make sure that this person does not have TB. So do a very good clinical assessment. You may have to do some AFB blood cultures or regular blood cultures to make sure they don't have a bacterial entity as well. And it, chest x-ray and making sure clinically that they don't have tuberculosis before you, you give them this therapy for MEI. Before you stop prophylaxis, make sure that their CD4 count has risen to above 100 cells for the last three months and those who have never had, had MEI therapy. Those are for primary prophylaxis. And then you can restart primary prophylaxis if, it, if their CD4 count drops again to less than 50 cells per, per microliter. So the primary prophylaxis is actually a single agent. These are sort of the same agents we talked about before. It's either azithromycin or clarithromycin is, 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 are the recommended agents. Azithromycin can be given in two different fashions. 1,200 milligrams weekly, which is the easiest way of doing it. You pick a day of the week that the patient takes the pill and they take it all at one time. So the erythromycin can be given twice daily, and unfortunately, that's, that's the limitation of that regimen, but it's highly effective as well. Or if they have too much of GI side effect with the 1,200 milligram dose, you can split it up on the, the azithromycin to 600 milligrams twice weekly, but they still have to get the 1,200 milligrams a week. They can split it up in two different time periods within a week. The alternative regimen was the initial regimen way, way, way back of rifabutin to prevent, uh, pneumos uh, to prevent um, mycobacterium avian uh, intracellular infection. The issue with rifibutin is actually a, a lot of cytochrome P450 drug interaction issues with some of our protease inhibitors, some of our non nukes and other antiretroviral agents. So whenever you're looking to use rifibutin as a prophylaxis because they can't take the other regimens, um, you have to make sure you look at the drug, potential drug-drug interactions that, that could occur. We'll leave mycobacterium and go into cryptococcus. Probably the fourth and probably the final one I'm going to talk about as far as the 
the most common opportunity infections I see in a hospital setting. This can be a subacute meningitis or a meningoencephalitis. So really, again, it's subacute. Not a different, again, sort of like pneumocystis where it can come on slowly. Um, this can come on slowly as well. The common symptoms are fever, malaise, and headache. Not really that specific. But you can sometimes see um, and up to 20, 25% of cases, next diffus, photophobia, and other classic meningeal signs. Realize that in the majority of cases, you don't see that, however. Um, if they, this progresses, you can have a continued deterioration of their altered mental status, lethargy, and personality changes. Occasionally, you can see disease in other sites aside from the brain, including the skin or the, the lungs, where you actually see either pulmonary nodules or a little uh, obligatory papules on the skin that can occur in some individuals who have disseminated cryptococcosis. The diagnosis um, is usually done by lumbar puncture. Um, you can detect the cryptococcal antigen in the serial spinal fluid. You can also do it through the blood and bronchial alveolar lavage. Uh, once you have it in the serial spinal fluid, you know you have meningitis. Once you have it in the blood, you're not sure if you have it in the, in the CSF, but you have to check. If you have it in a bronchial alveolar lodge, you can, you can, you can uh, um, potentially believe that you have it in lungs. You got to understand, though, that, that this is not completely highly sensitive. You can have false negative results, and you should not be swayed against the possibility of cryptococcal disease by just a negative antigen. On the lumbar puncture, you can do an Indian ink stain, where um, you can actually see by a, a black Indian ink stain the the broad the uh, the thick cell the thick wall of the cryptococcus. Um, it's lower sensitivity, but once you see it, it's pretty di uh, distinctive. Occasionally, you can actually get blood cultures to come back positive if people have cryptococcal meningitis and they have cryptococcemia, where cryptococcus grows in the bloodstream. Patients can also have patients again, as I stated earlier, who have a positive serial cryptoantigen have to really have a CSF evaluation. I mean, a lumbar puncture to exclude CNS disease, and that includes a, a detection of opening pressure and and other CSF findings. What you normally see is a mildly elevated protein in CSF, either a, no, a normal or slightly low glucose. You see a, a significant number of white cells, a, a lymphocytic pleocytosis, and many yeasts, either by gram stain or by any ink stain. Most, well, up to 75% of people have an elevated opening pressure, which is usually defined as opening pressure greater than 20 centimeters of, of water. They do that when they do this spinal tap, they measure the pressure. Um, and this, is, this poses a, a significant potential morbidity in these individuals, and this is what causes much of their symptoms and can, can if not treated adequately, can uh, affect their mental status and long-term neurologic status, if not uh, taken care of adequately. Treatment for cryptococcosis is really separated in what's called phases, the induction phase, the consolidation phase, and the chronic maintenance phase. The induction phase is usually a, 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 at least two weeks in therapy, and then and typically involves the utilization of liposomal amphotericin, 3 to 4 milligrams per kilogram daily, plus an agent called flucizine that is given orally four times a day. Usually we keep them in the hospital during the setting, and many times depending on their opening pressure to these serial lumbar punctures. Consolidation therapy follows that and, and includes uh, fluconazole, usually at least of a dose of 400 milligrams daily for at least eight weeks. Thereafter, you can reduce the fluconazole dose to 200 milligrams daily for chronic, chronic maintenance therapy. Issues that you really have to focus on with cryptococcus when you're taking care of these individuals in the hospital setting is the elevated intracranial pressure. And elevated intracranial pressure can be quite substantial. I've seen intracranial pressures above 55 centimeters of water, and people can get neurologic, um, obviously, coma, cranial nerve dysfunction, diplopia, and all kinds of risk of cerebral edema and, and, and death if this elevated intracranial pressure is not dealt with. So therefore, the opening pressure each time the lumbar puncture is, is done should be performed. And the, the management, what happens is you have a elevated opening pressure. That, that means you still have risk for further brain damage, and therefore, current guidelines suggest daily lumbar punctures for removal of cerebral spinal fluid to, until the time period where your opening pressure is normal or less than, or about 20 or less. If it continues, you continue to do daily lumbar punctures or, or CSF shunting can be done with, such as a VP shunt if the lumbar puncture is not effective or not tolerated. Drugs like a, a corticosteroids, mantol, acetazolamide are not really recommended. 
just like other entities, you can get iris with cryptococcosis. So again, if if you happen to experience iris, have a patient experience iris, you have to at that point continue antiretroviral therapy, antifungal therapy, and if severe, you might have to consider short course of corticosteroids just to be just to get past the iris stage of the uh, reactivation. However, if they're not an antiretroviral therapy when you diagnose them with cryptococcosis, you should consider delaying initiating antiretroviral therapy at least until the completion of induction therapy. So essentially, at least two to ten weeks after initiation of antifungal therapy to try to reduce that risk. To prevent recurrence, again, uh, you're taking lifelong suppressive therapy unless immune reconstitution occurs on antiretroviral therapy. Again, the preferred regimen is using fluconazole at least at 200 milligrams daily. You, consider, you can consider discontinuing maintenance therapy if all these are occur. There have, it's been one-year therapy, they're asymptomatic, they're on antiretroviral therapy, and they had sustained increase in their CD4 count to over 100 cells per microliter for at least three months or more. If their CD4 drops to less than 100 again, you have to restart fluconazole for secondary prophylaxis. I want to sort of last stage of my talk discuss vaccines in general with HIV individuals. I know we have had a lot of talk recently about vaccines and, and in children and, what, and diseases that should be preventable, but we should also focus on our HIV population as well because there are diseases that I see in the hospital setting that are preventable with vaccines that unfortunately have not been in our population. It is, vaccines are one of the most valuable and cost-effective preventative measures available, bar none. And vaccines are generally safe, but maybe slightly less immunogenic in our HIV population because of the immune system by definition, it's not as effective as it responsive to the vaccine as it should be. The vaccine, best, best vaccine responses are those who have CD4 count that are high or percentage that are high. They're, they are best in those who have low viral loads and best in those whose immune systems are not devastated by HIV or before they're devastated by HIV or after they've been immune reconstituted by antiretroviral therapy. We'll talk about a few, but of the live vaccines, we try to avoid, in general, those that you list uh, there, including the live attenuating influenza vaccine, the flu mist, nasal, the zoster vaccine right now is um, not recommended, the oral typhoid, the smallpox vaccine obviously is not, yellow fever is not recommended, uh, especially in those whose CD4 counts are very low, and the oral polio, which is not really used in this country, is also not recommended. However, the MMR and the varicella, the chickenpox, so to speak, vaccine, uh, can still be given if the CD4 count is still above 200. So our, our perineal uh, or our young individuals who still need measles vaccine or varicella vaccine, if their CD4 count is above 200, can be given those vaccines, even though they're a sort of live attenuated vaccine. Pneumococcal vaccine has, um, or pneumococcal vaccine, there's two of them that are now available. And there have been some, some changes in the recent recommendations of, of pneumococcus. Unfortunately, not all of us have access to uh, both the 23 valent poly uh, pneumococcal polysaccharide vaccine or the uh, 7 valent uh, pneumococcal conjugate vaccine. Most of us have the 23 valent available, and as you see, it's listed there as the alternative agent. With the with the, with the new PCV vaccine, the poly uh, the pneumococcal conjugate vaccine, there seems to be a better immuno immunologic response. So. The preferred schedule right now is if you have access to that, that uh, conjugate vaccine, you should utilize that followed by the um, 23 valent uh, polysaccharide vaccine at least eight weeks later. It could be longer than that, but it has to, can't be shorter than that. Um, some people would consider longer until the CD4 counts above 200 so they can get a robust booster response. What happens if you have uh, 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 individuals who already had the 23 valent uh, polysaccharide vaccine? Well, you can receive the conjugate vaccine at least one year after the last dose of the 23 valent vaccine, and then you can be vaccinated them one more time at five years, and then one more time after age 65 with the polysaccharide 23 valent vaccine. So there's, the reason that these, these changes have occurred is to improve the immunogenicity of the polysaccharide of the, uh, of the pneumococcal vaccine, because there have been still invasive pneumococcal disease noted in hospitalizations for many individuals, not just HIV, but non-HIV as well. The hepatitis vaccine should be, uh, should be given to all HIV individuals without evidence of prior immunity. So if they don't have a hepatitis B disease and they don't have surface antibody, you should try to vaccinate them. Ideally, you should try to vaccinate if their CD4 counts greater than 350, but you should not defer for lower counts, meaning don't wait 
uh, if you can. Um, you should still try, even though the response rates are lower, less than that. Decreased response rates, again, I see in co-infected patients with HIV, so you should check um, hepatitis B surface antibody or anti-hepatitis B surface antibody type one month after the three-shot series. If there's no response to that three-shot series, you should consider revaccination at that point, although some experts might wait to revaccinate until the CE4 count rebounds with effective heart, such as getting 350 cells. Other mechanisms to try to increase your response to hepatitis B includes doubling the dose. In fact, that's while it's um, insufficient evidence to recommend this, many people will do that. And this is done, for example, in other immunosuppressed individuals, including our people who have end-stage renal disease. They increase the response by, by giving a 20 microgram dose of uh, hepatitis B vaccine rather than the typical 20 microgram dose. Hepatitis A, again, a two-dose vaccine should be given to everybody who has, doesn't have immunity to hepatitis A. Um, response to the vaccine is reduced to those who have CD4 counts of less than 200, and some would wait until the CD4 counts at least over 200 on antiretroviral therapy. The issue is not as urgent as it is with hepatitis B. The response should be reassessed again uh, with the Hep A series, uh, with the Hep A IgG one month after the vaccination series. If not immune, again, you, can, you should try to revaccinate and see if they can get a response. How about the influenza vaccine? Again. Recommended annually. I know this year's vaccine wasn't a great match to the most predominant strain, but it's still effective. Um, again, for HIV purposes, the influenza vaccine is more effective among those who are CD4 counts of above 100 cells per microliter, but I still vaccinate those who are less than 100 cells. I vaccinate I, I anybody I can, realizing that the effectiveness is less when the CD4 count is lower. Again, using, use only the inactivated vaccine. Do not use the flu mist, the live attenuated co-adapted influenza vaccine. Um, the easier way also is to make sure people around your patients are taken care of. Healthcare workers, household contacts, those should also be vaccinated and actually take the opportunity while they may be in, their, in the room with those patient, with patient to tell them that so that you can prevent the household from having influenza enter their household and therefore uh, reducing the risk of the HIV infected individual from getting influenza. I do want to uh, um, finish by acknowledging a few things. Uh, some of the slides used in this presentation were used from, uh, from the AETC National Resource Center. Um, slide, comprehensive slide deck um, by Susa Coffee. And, and the bottom of the slide shows the, the resource, how you can get to that slide set. I also want to really promote this. This is the opportunistic infection HIV AIDS pocket card. Um, I helped uh, with the editing of this card. It is a card that I still use a lot because, frankly, as I stated earlier, this opportunistic infection guidelines, they're 400 pages. There's no way you can keep up with it, everything. This pocket card actually has a lot of information on more than just what I've talked about here. Um, and it's quite, uh, quite useful when I have rounds and, and I'm taking care of my HIV patients in the hospital. And I've heard it's been useful also in the clinic setting with, um, uh, when we had patients coming in as far as timing of discontinuation of, of uh, secondary prophylaxis and drug-drug interactions as well. Um, the references I use include the, the guidelines, which is listed in the first reference there. The second reference is the actual uh, ACIP vaccine reference. Uh, I realized this weekend, after I did this talk, that uh, they are updated to the 2015 ACIP adult immunization schedule. And that was actually published in Annals of Internal Medicine. But you also should be able to get it at the CDC website listed there. They probably just uh, uploaded it uh, actually February 5th. As far as changes to, the, to HIV and vaccines, there really were none for HIV. So what I've spoken to you uh, in this talk is actually still accurate. And I will be happy now to uh, let my voice rest and see if there's any questions from the audience that uh, are willing to discuss anything that we've talked about or other issues that I may or may not be able to, to answer uh, while I'm available here. Thank you very much, Dr. Montero, for that excellent overview of opportunistic infections. So the first question that uh, we have is uh, related to the regimens that you were discussing for primary prophylaxis. Can you just review which regimens would be appropriate to cover both PCP and toxo prophylaxis? Which, okay, uh, which drug combinations? So, uh, so the question was, as we said earlier, there's, there's several combinations that you can use 
that prophylaxis both toxoplasmosis and pneumocystis. And that's why uh, sometimes you can get, you get two stones with, with one throw, so to speak. The most commonly used regimen, again, is trimethylene sulfamethoxazole, brand name, Septra or Bactrim. Again, the doses that, are, that are, are, are effective for both and are primary for both is a double strength tablet daily. Alternatives for toxoplasmosis, but still primary for pneumocystis include a single strength tablet daily, and then alternatives for both is three times weekly. Also effective for both is a tobacquone. Um, 1,500 milligrams daily. Um, however, uh, as I stated earlier, Dapstone, while effective alone for, pneum for pneumocystis, is not really effective alone for toxoplasmosis, and you need to add pyrimethamine and leucovorin to that regimen. Um, uh, that is, is critical, because if you do use Dapstone in someone who's soft allergic, for example, and can tolerate Dapstone, and their CD4 count is less than 100, and their uh, toxo-ITG is positive, you really have to provide them adequate therapy for uh, adequate primary prophylaxis for toxoplasmosis and add pyrimethamine and leucovorin to Dapsone if you want to choose to use Dapsone in that setting. Um, that's really the most commonly used um, regimens that are out there. Uh, pentamidine, another one that's used for pneumocystis prophylaxis effectively um, by, by a, a respiratory guard, it has no uh, efficacy at all for toxoplasmosis. So, Trimethamine sulfamethoxazole and probably a toloquone alone are, 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 are the primary prophylaxis that, that, that are effective for both. Dapsone will only with pyrimethamine uh, will be effective with both. Without pyrimethamine, it's only uh, effective against pneumocystis as primary prophylaxis. We uh, often see that uh, patients are put on the atovaquone when they could potentially be candidates for dapsone. And what we've seen in our clinics is that a lot of patients do not like the taste of atovaquone, so taking that medication can be an issue as far as adherence. I don't know if that's been your experience as well. It's got a banana citrus flavor that <laughs> doesn't quite... <laughs> you're, 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 you're absolutely right. Um, in the hospital setting, sometimes we have to switch medications, not only for allergies, but for example, maybe because of bone marrow, type, bone marrow suppression, and people may switch to a toluchone because it has less bone marrow suppression. But you're absolutely right. The, many patients do not like the taste of the liquid, the toluchone. Um And I caution against it because if you don't like it, you're not going to take it. And I, right. I, I do worry about, about that sometimes. So sometimes it's actually better to use a, another, another regimen, even if it might be multiple drugs, um, if it's not going to work as well because you're not going to take it. The primary issue it's many not, times with our patients is making sure they're adherent, and we got to make that easy on them. If taste is the problem, because it really is a problem with this agent potentially, then we have to know that. And it also, I believe it still is uh, quite expensive, so yes, that's it's another not cheap issue. either. You're absolutely right. I don't know the cost, but I do know it's not cheap either. It's a liquid form. Yeah. yeah. And just to, to remind everyone that um, with Dapsone, generally we obtain the G6PD, the glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase test, before using it because of the risk of the met hemoglobinemia. But if certain populations are more at risk, so do you do that test in all of your patients before starting the Dapsone, or do you tend to, to just do it in certain, uh, with certain ethnicities? Um. I believe um, I, I, when I start Dapsone, I, if I haven't checked it before, uh, I do check it. Um, and usually I use Dapsone in a prophylaxis, so I actually have time to check it. Um, in the clinic setting, I believe many clinics actually check, screen them up front so they're actually identified as G6PD deficient or not. While that's not an official requirement, I think it's done in many settings so that you already have that information available. I, so I actually rather have that for Dapsone because I, I am afraid. I am afraid of the the uh, the anemia that can develop if uh, if they are deficient. And yes, there's certain ethnic backgrounds you know, on that are, are higher risk, but I'd rather be careful and uh, and and uh, and have that set uh, with it known for sure. So can you also comment on the use of seizure prophylaxis 
medications for patients that have toxoplasmosis. This is something that we've commonly seen with our, our patients. Yes, uh, I have a feeling now that this question may come up. And I, feel, I, I think there's a discrepancy in uh, neurologists and internists and I guess us HIV providers of who needs or who doesn't need seizure prophylaxis for toxoplasmosis. Obviously, everybody agrees. If this patient came in with a seizure, you need seizure prophylaxis. They've already proven that they hit that seizure threshold. Um, what, what sometimes doesn't occur, doesn't occur afterwards is it's describing the person who has a lot of edema there. As, is that seizureish? Do you prophylax them or not? If it, I don't think you necessarily need to. They've already proven that they have edema there, and they've proven that they don't have a seizure. Uh, however, I've run into many other specialties, like you know, some neurologists and some internists who actually would rather prophylax them, even though I, I do not believe that's in the official guidelines. Thank you. And uh, we've run into that as well. And a lot of times we've seen patients put on medications that are an issue as far as drug interactions with oh, yes, their Oh, especially phenytoin in our, in our yeah. patients. I can see that happening. And uh, one last uh, question. A few years ago I had seen information about the use of the 1,3-beta-glucan assay for the diagnosis of PCP. We're certainly not using that on the outpatient setting. Is that something routinely being used? on the inpatient setting to assist in the diagnosis of PCP? I, I've, I've never used it. And, um, I saw papers on it several years ago, but frankly, um, uh, we don't use it for diagnosis for pneumocystis. Um, there were a few articles written, and I, I believe um, from North Carolina there's a couple people that were for utilizing it. We at Tampa General aren't using it, and I suspect most individuals are not relying on that. Although there is there is some data for it, I cannot speak of how good the data is for okay. uh, diagnosing. The Florida Caribbean AIDS Education and Training Center's mission is to ensure that physicians, nurses, nurse practitioners, physician assistants, dentists, pharmacists, case managers, and other healthcare professionals in Florida, Puerto Rico, and the U.S. Virgin Islands receive state-of-the-art information, training, and consultation on the prevention, chronic disease management, and treatment of HIV and AIDS. Funding is provided by the HIV AIDS Bureau of the Health Resources Services Administration U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. The Florida Caribbean AIDS Education and Training Center provides a variety of HIV AIDS education, training, consultation, and resources. Visit our website, www.fcaetc.org, to learn more. Stay in touch with us by joining our mailing and email list. You will receive notices about upcoming educational opportunities as well as new and updated HIV AIDS resources. You may also sign up to receive our HIV CareLink newsletter. Visit our website, fcaetc.org, and click on Join Our Mailing and Email List at the top of the homepage. Be sure to also connect with us on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, and YouTube. The Florida Caribbean AETC provides consultation services to clinicians in Florida, Puerto Rico, and the U.S. Virgin Islands. If you have questions related to the content of this program or would like consultation on the diagnosis, prevention, and treatment of HIV AIDS and related conditions, we would love to hear from you. We also offer consultation on the interpretation of resistance test results. Visit www.fcaetc.org forward slash consultation to ask your question today. The Florida Caribbean AIDS Education and Training Center provides pocket-sized treatment guideline resources that detail the federally approved HIV AIDS medical practice guidelines such as the adult antiretroviral therapy, hepatitis, pediatric antiretroviral therapy, adult opportunistic infections, tuberculosis, and pre-exposure prophylaxis, non-occupational post-exposure prophylaxis, and occupational PEP. In addition, we have summarized common practices for the post-exposure prophylaxis in pediatrics adolescents. 
We have also developed resources that provide an overview for treatment of sexually transmitted diseases in HIV-infected patients and therapeutic agents for oral manifestations. Visit our website to download or request copies of these resources. The Florida Caribbean AIDS Education and Training Center provides web-based educational opportunities to increase the knowledge and skills of HIV healthcare providers. Live and on-demand options are available. Visit www.fcaetc.org forward slash education for more information. Florida Caribbean AIDS Education and Training Center, Project ECHO, provides a web-based didactic presentation on a current HIV treatment issue based upon current Department of Health and Human Services and other accepted treatment guidelines. Project ECHO also provides an opportunity to discuss case presentations submitted by participants and an opportunity to network with both your peers and HIV experts. All members of care and treatment teams, including case managers, are welcome to participate. Information discussed is targeted at providers with basic or intermediate HIV-AIDS treatment experience. Choose from four session types. Visit www.fcaetc.org forward slash echo to view upcoming sessions and to register. If you are located outside of our region, the Clinician Consultation Center provides consultation services via the phone numbers listed here. Or you may also visit www.nccc.ucsf.edu for more information. To locate the AETC in your region, visit www.aidsetc.org.